Hey, so it's been some time since we last have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Basically, it's just me speaking to a camera and God knows how many people I will reach with this video. But anywho, anyhow, um, I'm just gonna record it in probably one take and to speak to you about how I'm feeling right now regarding the market, uh, my portfolio, um, how things are playing out, my thinking, my thought process, etc. So just some background, I think the US indexes continue to push all-time highs. The SPY, um, as of today, the date of this recording is the 27th of March. Um, SPY is up 9 point something percent, close to 10 percent year to date. The QQQ is up 10 point something percent. The STI, which is the country I'm in, um, the Streets Time Index, which tracks essentially the SGX or the Singapore market, um, they're up, I think, close to 1 2 percent. It's essentially flat. The CSI 300, which basically tracks um, all the Chinese listed shares, they're up 3 percent. The Hang Seng, they're down 2.3 percent. And the Hang Seng Tech, which monitors the tech companies tech conglomerates in China, they are down negative 10%. What a time to be alive. So I think um, specifically for the CSI 300 or the Chinese stock market in general, um, we are seeing some sort of signs from the Chinese government perspective about wanting to resuscitate and to save the economy. I think before 2024, the last two years, they are very focused into trying to save the economy, trying to prop up um, the property market, um, allowing them to gracefully deleverage and also really focusing on creating jobs and opportunities and yeah, making sure that the economy doesn't collapse. So I think last year, they did kind of outperform expectations. They came in at 5.2% GDP growth year on year, um, above the 5% expected, but I guess the stock market didn't really care about it. Um, they basically continue selling down many of the equities. And it has been three years in a row now um, for most of these Chinese indexes to underperform. And even recently, I think January or February, um, the Chinese national team, basically their sovereign funds and um, some of their investment funds, um, they started buying in to the stock market to basically save the A shares market. But there is still um, continued weakness and basically a en masse vote of no confidence to the Chinese market, which is why you see many of these Hong Kong shares um, showing many signs of weakness, but the A shares is basically propped up by um, continuous demand um, based on the local investing pool and base. But that's it. I think a video from one of the creator, I've forgotten who, he was basically outlining um, in order for there to be a sustained amount of rally, um, specifically in the Chinese market, you'll need foreign fund flows to come into it. But as of now, um, we don't really see it. Uh, on another note, I think the crypto market, Bitcoin, it's up 62% year-to-date basis. I'm smiling because I think crypto in general or Bitcoin, it's basically a representation or an indicator for how much risk the market wants to partake in. And seemingly, it seems like everybody, it, it's a risk on environment, but uh, Chinese equities, still too risky. Yo, Weibo is back with really awesome sign-up rewards. So for new users to Weibo, you can now sign up and make an initial deposit of 500 US dollars to enjoy five free Nvidia shares, each worth between 10 to 500 US dollar. On top of that, get three years commission-free Singapore stock trading and one month commission-free US stock trading. Oh, did I also mention that if you complete five US stock, ETF or options buy trades within 30 days, you will also get 15 times 10 USD US stock trading vouchers and 15 times 20 USD US options trading vouchers credited to your account. So you can essentially make 30 trades with almost zero cost. And of course, this is not the only promotion campaign Weibo currently offers. So for new users, you can actually participate in their upsize Moneybo campaign to potentially get up to 5,000 US dollars worth of rewards. I'll leave the terms and conditions and sign up link in the description box down below. So stop procrastinating and start taking advantage of this promotion today. Thank you Weibo for sponsoring this video. So I think one common question that comes to mind immediately is, are we back to the 2021 uh, mania or the craze or the hype, however you want to call it? Personally, I think now, um, right now in 2024, it was really riding on this AI momentum, artificial intelligence, uh, many of these big tech companies. You have companies like Nvidia, AMD, SMCI. Um, many of these companies are benefiting crazily from this um, huge AI boom. Personally, actually I was 
initially quite skeptical um, because AI was not really a new theme or new trend. Um, we already see the implementations, the adoption from um, robotics, delivery, um, supply chain, uh, algorithms and stuff. Many of these big tech companies are already meaningfully and earnestly employing AI. But I guess it's really ChatGPT, generative AI, um, the level of computing and basically most of the businesses in this current economic landscape, they are getting disrupted, which is why um, the impact is visibly seen. I think it's flowed down in terms of revenue growth to the bottom line and that's why companies like NVIDIA, they are benefiting greatly. But of course, um, now the bare side of the argument, as always, as any um, bullish rally, is how sustainable um, this sort of earnings and consumption patterns would continue. Because I guess, in a way, um, I'm not too sure, I'll, I'll just include this graph in post-edit. The adoption rate is always very high, the interest is always very high in the first um, wave, but then thereafter it will die down. After it kind of goes through that sustained um, despair, then you will see those true adoption takes place. The interesting thing is we are still in a very high rate environment and behemoth companies like Max 7, they have a very strong balance sheet. They are benefiting greatly from both the high interest rate because they are able to earn very high interest on those cash and cash equivalent. And on the second point that is not often talked about, I think the idea of cheap capital has slowly dissipated, I think from 2020, 2021. Um, those eras of cheap funding, um, the venture capital basically just splashing money as and when they want to. Um, they, are, they have significantly slowed down their activities. You can see that IPO activities have also slowed down, which is why I think um, for many of these big tech companies, they've also benefited from um, the starving of potential startups or potential competitors. So they are basically benefiting on two fronts. But I think back to the question on whether we are in the 2021 hype or mania, um, personally, I think anecdotally, I don't think so because it doesn't feel or it doesn't seem as crazy as before and people around me aren't really as hyped up about crypto, about many of this um, risk on assets compared to 2021. I think back in 2021, um, literally everyone around me, um, they're talking about crypto and how much they have earned. Um, right now, the tone is, is kind of dying down, which is quite interesting because crypto is my kind of leading indicator and Bitcoin basically rallied to near an all-time high or back to its all-time high again, but not too many people are excited about it, whether we are back to that kind of um, risk on appetite and environment or not. So interestingly, even though Bitcoin might rally back to kind of its all-time high region, but not as many people or not as many retail investors around me are as excited, which means that actually adoption might really be real, um, Maybe it's because of the ETF, because of the halving. Uh, not as much excitement, yet the price continuously rally uh, means demand is sustaining. And I think it's exciting times ahead, especially for many people that are invested in Bitcoin. Now, personally, how am I holding up? I recently did a portfolio review. Um, I'm just going to leave the link in the description and probably... Um, an edit, post-edit. So you have probably seen most of my holdings and I just logged in again to check. So I currently have 20 counters or 20 individual names. 17 are in the green. Two is negligible. Negligible in, in the red because they are SG reads and they haven't really been moving much. And one in the deep red, which is Alibaba. And I do believe that most of you are also in the same scenario, especially for those of you who have a huge percentage of your portfolio allocated to Baba. Um, over, overall, even though like there are 17 green counters, I'm still in the red purely because uh, my biggest bet has yet to play out, which is um, what most of you have known. I think interestingly, even my speculative bet on uh, Chinese banks, they are holding up much better. They provided dividends, good dividends, um, even had capital appreciation despite all the fear-mongering on the Chinese banks and Evergrande and the property crisis and whatnot. So that was just something interesting, maybe because of my entry price as well. That's one potential factor. And um, on the flip side, the US market is on a tear. I think as long as you bought fundamentally decent companies over the last 12 to 18 months, you probably are experiencing a great amount of green and uh, you have also made good money. Um, especially so if you pick the Max 7 stocks, uh, maybe excluding Tesla, but that's besides the point. So I do feel a sense of helplessness, I think on two different angles. I think the whole financial game feels 
quite rigged uh, in my perspective, especially when there's a lot of incentive to kind of prop up the markets. So it feels good in the short term, but it's not good for net accumulators in the long run, especially for the younger batch or the younger audience like myself. We want to accumulate companies at reasonable or at cheap valuations. And it's really during these times of crisis and when the market goes into ebbs and flows, when it goes down, um, that's the point when we start accumulating with our money. But we really can't, we, we can't accumulate much, at least over the last two years. We, we have seen over the last two bear markets, at least in 2020 and 2022, there was really this snap, crash, and then it come back. There was not much time to accumulate. Um, the time taken to recovery is, I don't know, less than six months, less than nine months. And it cultivates kind of the habit amongst new investors to basically just close your eyes and just buy whenever there's a dip because you know at the back of your mind that it will always come back. And because this feedback time is very quick, um, it kind of inevitably cultivates that kind of habit. Um, of course, if you compare it to our Chinese counterparts, um, that's another story. Now, secondly, on a second angle, I think many people are also in the same boat, um, basically stuck back holding some of these Chinese equities, Chinese tech companies, Alibaba specifically, etc. And they are probably beating themselves up for the last two to three years um, because of wasted time and also wasted opportunity. So to me, of course, I'm still diamond handing, but I think it's really not a good feeling to be in. And um, I appreciate and I completely understand um, the various investor sentiments and perspective around um, investing into Chinese tech today. But I do feel like we are kind of in abnormal times with how things are basically shaking and developing in the world today. I think just think about it over the last, I guess, five to eight years, anything that happens, I think most governments basically just print money. They print to win and intuitively, we all know that um, this is not sustainable in the long run. However, on an individual basis, you know that this is unsustainable to continuously spend. But on a macro level or on a country level, it doesn't seem to be bothered. You can basically just print your way out. And as long as um, they, there's trust, um, the music is still on, which is basically what's happening in the US. And of course, I'm not saying that the US is bound to fail or it's bound to collapse. But I'm just saying that we are really living in very, very interesting times. It's counterintuitive to personal finance, to investing, to whatever there is. That's it. I don't think we are necessarily in the bubble territory right now. And I'm also not saying that the US market would crash or whatnot. So as long as the spending and the consumption continues in a sustainable sustainable manner, I think we will continue dancing. Um, that's it. I do find it harder and harder to basically deploy capital to many of these US companies. So personally, I still find Chinese and Hong Kong companies to have the best risk reward now. Um, the downside, there's, there's really very strong downside protection here. I think if you were to really compare these different counters and different names, looking at it um, objectively today, um, if you compare, let's say, Alibaba versus Amazon, do I think Alibaba has a higher chance to go down 50% from here or do I think Amazon has a higher probability of going down 50% from here? Of course, not barring any crazy incidents like um, the CCP basically um, confiscating everything. I mean, that's a really, really black swan event. But if you just look at how things are basically progressing, I do feel like a lot of the US counterparts have a very high probability of correcting downwards 30, 40, 50% compared to our Chinese counterparts just sheerly from the fact that um, they, are, they are much closer to Earth and gravity is pulling onto them. Um, but that's it, of course. Um, on the flip side, it's also true because they are already up. Momentum tend to carry them even higher. That's also why uh, many of these US stocks continue to push all-time high while um, Chinese stocks remain on the ground. Um, so you kind of have to weigh your risk-reward and think about um, do you care more about the upside or care more about the downside? But at least to me now, I do feel that a lot of these Hong Kong names um, they have very strong downside protection. But for me, um, right now, why am I not aggressively, acu continuously accumulating on some of these Hong Kong names? It's really on a portfolio concentration and diversification point of view. So I think specifically, if you look into Hong Kong names, um, not only do you get the cushion, which is the margin of safety due to their low valuations, you also get very strong diversification benefits. So there's a recent um, article or recent report that was released by Bridgewater. Um, disclaimer, they are a huge proponent of diversifying and diversification because of the readings and teachings of um, Ray Dalio. So, and I quote, the most diversifying markets are those where the key drivers of asset prices, growth, inflation, and monetary policy are lowly correlated to other countries. Today, most investors are overly concentrated in US assets and Chinese assets are extremely diversifying because China has a relatively close economy and is one of the largest demand centers in the world. 
So I know whatever I cite or whatever I say now, I'm talking about diversification, etc. None of you is going to treat it seriously because most of you will ju probably just point towards China and their Chinese stock market and say that, hey, look at how badly they've performed over the last 10 years and especially the last three years. They haven't even walked out of their bear market um, that, was, that started in 2020, 2021. So I think the funny story is, here's the common consensus. Regardless of what China does, um, their stock market is still going to go down. Whether they're in an expansionary monetary environment or whether they start printing money to basically save the property market or even if their national team comes in to support the stock market, um, everybody already have the expectation that whatever they do, um, the stock market will continue to go down. On the flip side, whatever the US does, whether the Federal Reserve says that, oh, we're going to keep rates higher for longer, um, even though it's in a hawkish environment, they don't care. Um, stocks will continue rising just because they are the United States. So I think we are really in interesting periods of history. And I think five, 10 years back, if we look back into this situation, um, we will have another story to tell um, our kids, our grandkids. So I think my takeaway is pretty simple. Investing and stock picking and playing the financial game, it's a very, very emotionally taxing and draining game where you'll need actually a bit of stubbornness, a bit of arrogance, a bit of everything and some might look at it as bad attributes to basically stick to your thoughts, stick to your philosophy and stick to your guns. And even though the market, which is an extension of everyone because everybody is voting with their dollar bills, um, they're telling you otherwise, they're telling you that, hey, this is a bad investment, um, you're losing money for at least two, three years now, why are you not giving up yet? Come over, come over to the other side where we are earning so much more money. Why, why look at the opportunity cost, look at how much money you could have made, etc, etc. So to me, I think it's fairly simple. Um, if you do have a framework or an investing philosophy, stick to it. Um, as long as it breaches the rule, um, basically, whether you look at it from a mode perspective, um, Alibaba is losing market share, Alibaba is no longer first in e-commerce, um, they're no longer first in cloud, um, the strat there's, there's a lot of strategic missteps, they're not allocating capital properly, they're not taking care of shareholders. If any of those checkboxes are your deal breakers and they break it time and time again. Okay, um, I've spoken for too long and my battery died, but I think just to continue on the point, if your thesis of selling is just because oh, the stock is down for two years, then I think that's not a very sound decision-making framework anyway. So I think just to kind of end off or to close off this discussion, um, there's one thing that I kind of learned over the years, uh, over the last three, four years, is that to always be open-minded and to listen to where um, opportunities are. And don't be fixated on, even though I do believe that Hong Kong, China, that's one um, investing team that offers great amount of value for investors. Um, you can al always be open-minded to basically do your homework and to learn other spaces. And likewise, I think I've made multiple videos on this channel talking about Meta back when it was basically trading down like nobody's business. And also when Amazon was trading down because of their investment cycle. And there's one more that was TSMC that I can recall off the top of my head that was also in that semicon down cycle. So I think as long as you have done your homework, um, you don't have to be too fixated or too close-minded saying that, oh, I found this holy grail to investing and there's only one investment that I must invest and make my money in. So I guess that's just my perspective on um, different investing styles and uh, opportunities out there in the market today. Um, disclaimer still, I think people like to misconstrue what I say. Yes, I still think Hong Kong, China, that large part, um, still very undervalued. I'm still holding on strongly, but from a diversification perspective, that's why I'm allocating more money there. Um, that said, I think when we look at things in totality, um, I'm not necessarily buying um, US names very aggressively right now because I can't really see the opportunity. So I've been trying to accumulate cash, at least for now, I think this month, in the month of March, I haven't bought anything and I don't intend to add anything more. I think, um, actually, the funny thing is over the last one month or so, or at least the last three weeks, a lot of my friends that are invested in NVIDIA and Tesla, um, they've been pitching my way a lot of things and I'm doing a lot of research and, and I guess analysis in that space. You guys can probably expect something soon about, I guess, the two companies. I really want to own those two companies. Um, even though I know um, a lot of you like to call me the cloner of Adam because I'm currently working for him and some stock picks are or some ideas are definitely generated and inspired by him but that said uh, I think Tesla is something that he will never touch I, I am interested in Tesla but maybe at the right valuation I think we shouldn't be very against the idea that oh just because a group of people um, hate my stock pick uh, I, I know that there's a lot of um, Alibaba holders hate Teslas and Tesla holders hate Alibaba 
I think Tesla is really onto something very interesting. Nvidia might probably be one of the most important companies in this entire decade or so. But I really still, I mean, there are few philosophies and few um, fundamental pillars of how I invest. Um, that is basically stopping me from entering or starting a position. So I think it's, if the opportunity comes and if it's interesting, maybe I may be even a Tesla shareholder. Who knows? So we'll see how it goes and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.